Good morning, Reformation. We're going to go ahead and get started. Great to see you. What a joy it is to be together, to see one another, to encourage each other in Christ. I love the just aroma of the joy that we share with each other. It's the Lord's Day, the day that we celebrate the resurrection of Christ from the dead and the day that we realize all the more our need for Christ, our need for one another as a local church. We're glad to be together. We're also glad for those who are joining us online, our church family, all guests and visitors who are with us both here and there. And we also want to wish all of our dads a happy Father's Day today. We're thankful for fathers. We're thankful for biblical manhood. We've talked quite a bit about fathers over the last few months as we walked through Colossians. Also, we realize that this is a tough day for many who mourn uh, hurtful experiences with their fathers, maybe having lost a father, And the ultimate point today is that we're reminded that for all who are in Christ, we have a heavenly Father who guides and guards every aspect of our lives, who we look to, who we trust, and who we rest in. And this morning, we're going to worship Him. You'll notice we'll begin with Psalm 96, verses 6 through 7 in our call to worship. Let's read that. The psalmist says, O come... Let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. We'll see this verse as we read Scripture again this morning, and we'll see this verse in the sermon as well this morning. But now we're going to confess our faith together. And the way that we've been doing that this month and will for the rest of the month uh, is through the Lord's Prayer. For centuries, ever since the Protestant Reformation, the church has emphasized the fundamental importance of learning and memorizing three key pillars, which consist of the Apostles' Creed, which we learned and recited last month together, and then also the Lord's Prayer, which we're emphasizing, learning and reciting this month, and then the Ten Commandments, which will come next month. These are fundamental pillars in our faith and their guides to help us pray to the Lord together. And so together, let's read the Lord's Prayer. And let's do that out loud. I want to encourage you to lift your voices from the ESV, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The early Baptist catechism goes on and explains of the Lord's Prayer in question 111, which asks, what do we pray for in the fourth petition? Answer, in the fourth petition, which is give us this day our daily We pray that of God's free gift, we may receive a competent portion of the good things of this life and enjoy His blessings with them. The early Baptist catechism asked in question 112, what do we pray in the fifth petition? Answer, in the fifth petition, which is, and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors, we pray that God, for Christ's sake, would freely pardon all our sins, which we are rather encouraged to ask because of His grace, we are enabled from the heart to forgive others. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven on Father's Day, we're thankful for reflections of the fatherhood of God reflected on this earth in earthly fathers. And everything that we see in our earthly fathers that we're thankful for We remember this morning that it's just a preview and a foretaste 
of coming attractions that we will experience fully and finally in the fatherhood of God in eternity. And Lord, in everything that is lacking and everything that is hurtful and harmful as we think about earthly fathers, some among us, we thank you that you perfectly exemplify everything fatherhood truly is. And so we come to you this morning as a fatherhood, uh, as a father. Lord, we just don't babble off empty, meaningless words. We come directly to your throne, seeking your face. We cry out, hallowed be your name. Lord, we want to see your name exalted among your people this morning. So much so that if one were to be among us this morning that doesn't know Christ, they would cry out, surely God is among you people. Your kingdom come and your will be done. Your authority exemplified in our midst, in our community, as it already is in heaven. Lord, we're thankful that you provide for our daily bread and all of our needs. You're so good and kind to us. And Lord, we stop this morning just simply to say thank you. Thank you. And we thank you that in Christ, you offer the forgiveness of our sins, which means the removal of our guilt and of our shame and of our sorrow. And Lord, we are thankful that we are free people because of Christ. God, thank you for forgiving wretched sinners like us who don't deserve it. And thank you that what matters now is not so much the past that we come from or the present that we're in, but who we are in Christ and what we're heading for. And we pray that you would help us to forgive others the way that we've been forgiven. And Lord, we pray that you would keep us from evil, that you would preserve your people from the attacks of sin, from our own sinful desires, from the plots and schemes of wicked men and of Satan and all of hell. Would you preserve your church and add to it, even this morning as we speak, what a joy it is to worship the King this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing to our King and let's sing all creatures of our God and King. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise Him, Alleluia. Thou burning sun with golden beam, thou silver moon with softer gleam. Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. 
if you would, remain standing and open your Bibles to Psalm 96, for the reading of God's true and inherent word. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous works among all the, all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will be judge. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult in everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. You may be seated, and I'll give you just a few minutes to lift up your own cares and concerns up to the Lord. Precious Father, we enter your courts this morning to confess our sin. Father, we thank you that we've been declared righteous through your faith in Christ. Because of your completed work in Jesus, Father, we have peace with you and access to your amazing grace. Yet in spite of all this, we continue to take our eyes off of you and as a result, make our, ourselves prone to despair every day. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to remember that Jesus is our strength. Help us to mature and rejoice in him even in our trials and tribulations. Father, give us grace that will produce a patient and godly character that is honoring to you. With all this, we pray in your great and holy name. Amen. Y'all stand and sing with me again. Men of sorrows, what a name for Hallelujah, what? 
remain standing and please turn in your Bibles to 1st Samuel chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 1 through 10. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord, my horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies, because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. <clears throat> Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. You may be seated. That ends the reading of God's holy, inspired, and errant word. Good morning, Reformation. We have been in the book of Colossians for some time now. And we have come to prayer in Colossians chapter 4. And I don't want to just continue to move on because I really hope to see prayer become an increasingly central part of our life as a church. It's one of the ordinary means of grace and it's central to the life of a Christian and to the life of a church. And so I want to spend some more time this morning looking at prayer before we move on from this uh, particular topic we read 1 Samuel because I wanted us to see an Old Testament prayer. And what I want us to think about this morning is patterning our prayers after the prayers of Scripture and seeing the priorities therein. I want you to look in your Bibles at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, as we move from an Old Testament prayer to a New Testament prayer and a prayer that is one of the key central prayers, I believe, in the New Testament, although there are many others. This is a more of a comprehensive prayer. We spend a fair amount of time in prayer as a church, and we want to increase that all the more. And when we pray together privately in family worship and win one another, when we're together in worship, it's commendable when we gather together to pray for the things that we pray for, chief of which is health concerns. But it's concerning when that is the extent of our prayer time. And oftentimes it's the only thing that we know how to pray for. But I want you to see in Paul's prayers that they reach new heights. And I want to continue to challenge us with something that I've challenged us 
with before, and it's this. What if our prayers, individually and as a church, were to begin to reflect more of the priorities of the prayers in Scripture rather than our own Western individualism? I have mentioned last Wednesday night and plan to continue this coming Wednesday night several helps to guide us in our prayer. We looked last Wednesday at the acrostic that we often use and Reformed churches have used for a long time, which is ACTS, which stands for Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. I've mentioned to you before, and we often use the Valley of Vision, which is a collection of Puritan prayers that I highly commend to you. Uh, we are learning as a church how to use the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and even next month, the Ten Commandments, as a framework to help fuel our prayers to the Lord. These are all guides to help us. But I want to point you to teach us how to pray and helps in our prayer to the most fundamental source that we have to start with, which is obviously Scripture. Scripture. I mean, have you even considered when we sing, when we're singing to the Lord, what are we doing as a church together? We're praying to the one another. Uh, we're praying to the Lord with one another through that song. But I want you to look in Scripture, and I want to give you two models of prayer. If you'll remember, because we took some time going through it, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 14, Paul begins to extend praise of God's blessing in Christ all throughout the church. He praises the Lord for all the blessings that we have in Christ. As you hold your place in Ephesians 3, I want you to flip back for a moment and see Paul's first prayer in Ephesians 1 that I think that we should pattern our own prayers after and then we'll build on that. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, Paul then moves to pray that God would give to the church wisdom and knowledge. And he prays that God would open their hearts to the hope of their calling, to the riches that they have in the heavenly places, and that they would know the immeasurable greatness of God's power that is available to them, that's already dis been displayed in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Paul moves from that prayer in Ephesians 2 to show that how God has taken Jew and Gentile, hostile enemies to one another, and he has broken down the wall of separation and he has regenerated these, these rebel sinners into royal saints and he's raised them up together as one body with him in Christ, namely the church, showing that how they're all equal and they're all one in Christ. And together in Ephesians, Paul shows us how this church is then a spiritual temple where Christ lives and he radiates or he displays his presence through his people, a people just like this covenant community, Reformation Baptist Church. And Paul shows us that what God is up to in the world is that he's using local churches to demonstrate something of his character through their covenant community, and he's putting it on display before cosmic creatures. And he's using what he's doing in the church as an object lesson before the entire creation to show that he's going to do that everywhere throughout all the earth. And what is he going to do? He is going to put everything in its rightful place before Christ. And what he has been doing in the church is showing what life looks like under the rule of King Jesus, pointing to the day when everything submits to its proper place in Christ. And then what this does is causes Paul to launch into another prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. He says, for this then. And if you'll look with me in Ephesians chapter 3, we'll bounce back a bit, back and forth, before we settle into our text for the, this morning. Is in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1, he says, for this reason I. For what reason? For the reason of everything I just told you. And then he says, for this reason, and he begins to launch into another prayer, but he digresses. He 
chases a rabbit that's inspired by the Holy Spirit and fully intended by God. And he says that he's been called as a messenger, as an apostle, to take this mystery that God is uniting one church of Jew and Gentile who will submit to his reign. He's doing that, and Paul is proclaiming that mystery throughout the ends of the earth. And then that will then launch Paul to have a heart full of prayer that the, he'll the, the, uh, then again unleash before his people, praying for them. I want you to flip back one more time to Ephesians 1, verse 15 through 23. I want you to note the themes that are in this prayer and the next one so that then we can weave these themes in our own prayers for one another. He prays for knowledge. He prays that they would know God's power and His fullness. He prays those things again in Ephesians 3. He repeats them. And then in Ephesians 3, he, he prays that not only would the church be aware of God's greatness, be aware of God's power, he then will in Ephesians 3 pray, God, please use that power and strengthen them with it in their inner being right where they need it. One scholar said he wants his readers to know that he prays for God to strengthen them in the inner human being so that Christ may dwell in their hearts and they may become strong enough to grasp the vast dimensions of Christ's love for them. And the ultimate goal of this prayer is that his readers might be filled up to the fullness of God, that they would be all that God created them to be as individuals, Ephesians 2.10, and as a church, Ephesians 2.15. Having said that, I want to encourage you to settle in to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 through 21, and have that right before you in your lap. As we look at the big picture here, I want you to notice in verses 14 through 15 that Paul begins by acknowledging the one to whom he prays. And then in verses 16 through 19, Paul will then begin to make his appeals to the Lord and we'll unpack those one after the other this morning. We plan to come back on Wednesday night in verses 20 through 21 and see how Paul then ends in adoration over the greatness and goodness of God. So in verses 14 through 19, we see a prayer report. And in verses 20 through 21, we see a doxology where he breaks out in praise. This is two sentences in the Greek, and they're long sentences. So the first part of this prayer in verses 14 through 19, as I said, begins with an introduction to the one to whom Paul prays, and then he launches in to two different prayer requests. Two different prayer requests, each of those types of requests having two more prayer requests. So there are four total, but two different general prayer requests. What Paul is doing is his heart has been has been set on fire and he just throws one clause, one phrase after the other and each one links to the one that comes before and it's just a beautiful prayer. The first two sections of the first two requests each contain two verbs and I want you to just kind of see the grammar here before we launch into the application of it. In the first request, he's praying these themes that I want you to now note. That we would be strengthened through the Spirit and indwelt with the Son. Strengthened with the Spirit and indwelt with the Son. One general request. And then the second request, he includes comprehending and knowing. These should be common themes in our prayers. Comprehending and knowing the fullness of God. And then the third request is a sort of climax of everything that come before. Look with me in verse 19. This is the goal of all of his prayer. Not only that God would give the church strength in verses 16 and 17. Not only in verse 18 and 19 that the church would understand the magnitude of God's love. But in summary that they would be filled with the fullness of all that God is. So again, he's praying for power. He's praying for understanding. He's praying for love. He's praying for spiritual maturity within the church. He's praying that the church would display God's manifold wisdom, 
his love, his strength, and his power before a watching world in need of Christ, before cosmic creatures in Ephesians 3.10. And then he's praying that, that, would, that they would live that out and the way that they treat one another, the same love that God has shown them in Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, that they would then walk in that love and extend it to one another. I love how John MacArthur summarizes. He says, In this great prayer of entreaty to God and exhortation to his children, Paul prays specifically for the inner strength of the Spirit, for the indwelling of Christ in the believer's heart, for incomprehensible love to permeate their lives, for them to have God's own fullness, and for God's glory, therefore, to be manifested and proclaimed. And each element builds on the previous ones, making a grand progression of enablement. Ephesians explains who we are in Christ, all of the spiritual riches that we have. And then now Paul, as any good pastor does, not only urges them to know who they are in Christ, but then prays that this would become a reality in their life. That they wouldn't just know it in their heads intellectually, like we Reformed folk often do. But they would really experience it in their hearts like never before. That this would be a reality to them and to us. I want you to know one more thing about Paul's prayer. It's a theme that should be constant in our prayers, and it's a theme that we intend to be central in our liturgy, our our order of worship, what we experience on Sunday morning. I want you to notice the Trinitarian focus of Paul's prayer. He prays to God the Father. He prays to the Father. And he's praying for this local church that they would be strengthened by the Holy Spirit. And he's praying, obviously, in the name of Jesus Christ, but he's praying that the Son, Christ, would dwell in them by faith and that they would grasp these truths with all the saints. I have been involved this week while on vacation and off of vacation in about five different pretty significant counseling situations and the more I reflect on the depravity of my own heart and the more that I, through the local church, see a test case just of the brokenness of our world, the more I realize that it almost doesn't even matter what the form or the face, the pain, the difficulty, the sin takes. The answer is the same. And I think that this prayer really is the answer to Reformation Baptist Church. I, whatever your issue is and whatever concern you bring in this, heart, in this building this morning, I think that this prayer is the answer to it. I think that this is what we, every single one of us, need. So I really want to encourage you to pray, to reflect, to see how this could minister to your soul and to see how this could be central in our church moving forward. These common themes. Number one, I want you to note in verses 14 through 15 that may we, as a church going forward, be a people who are given to humbly approaching the presence of God. May we be a people, number one, who are given to humbly approaching the presence of God. Look in verses 14 through 15. Again, he says, for this reason, for everything that I've already shared with you, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. He continues this prayer, looking back on the church being the dwelling place for God's presence knowing all of the blessings that we have in Christ. And he says, I bow my knees before the Father. This is not just a flippant casualness 
before the Lord. This is a careful consideration of the sovereign one to whom we pray. And he says, I bow my knees. Look at his posture. It literally means bend, and it's not the usual word that's used for prayer. We don't know for sure if literally Paul is on his knees or symbolically this is the attitude of his heart, but the posture of our body often reflects the attitude of our soul. And the normal posture for the church and for the early Jews as they prayed would have been standing. But Paul is bowing. And the reason he's bowing is that this signifies utter desperation, complete dependence. This signifies, God, only you will do. Only you are enough. There's a sense of urgency where Paul is not just some cold scholar, but he is deeply passionate with tears running down his face that we see bleeding through Acts chapter 20 and many other passages. And as he approaches the presence of God, the way that he understands his relationship before the Lord, he says, before the Father. Some translations add, of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Uh, there we are. What do we do on this Father's Day? We know that we as Christians ultimately have a Father in heaven who knows every hair on our head and every detail of our lives and nothing gets to your life without going across his desk and him signing off on it in one way or the other. He cares for his children. And so Paul looks to the Father, some scholars believe, that he's referring to by saying, from whom every family or the whole family in heaven and on earth is named. Some believe that he's referring to only Christians. And the truth is, if you're not a Christian, in this saving sense, God is not your Father. Your Father is the devil. And the Bible says that you may not even realize it, but you seek to do the things that he do, does, and you live according to his laws. But I believe that in this use of the word, what Paul is saying is every family on earth, every class of people, every family of people, the whole family, every classification of angel and all of their ranking and power, it might seem that they have all of them, believing and unbelieving alike, have their origin in God. We come from Him. He's the sovereign source of all of it. So Paul is praying to the one from whom everything owes its existence. Are you tracking with me? He understands the one to whom he bows his knees and his hearts to. And he also prays to the only one that sustains all things. Think about it. The only reason that you and I have a next breath is because Jesus sees to it that we do. Psalm 96, 6. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us, what? Kneel before the Lord, our maker. A Christian does that with a smile on his face. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Isaiah 40, 26 says, Lift up your eyes. Who created these? He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name. By the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. God is the cosmic potentate. He's the cosmic power from which everything owes its existence. Look in verse 14, verse 15 from which every family in heaven and earth is named. In other words, to be able to name something shows that you have creative authority over it. You're the creator and sustainer of it. And we belong to Him. And I want you to see how Paul approaches the Lord because you too, because of Christ, can approach the Lord in the same way. 
He comes to the Father with confidence of being accepted before God because of Christ and never rejected. He comes fearfully trembling with reverent regard to the one that he prays, who is sovereign over everything and does not put America's prayer requests on hold so that he can listen to what's going on in Japan. He hears it all at the same time. And at the same time, he's an intimate father who deeply cares for the concerns of his people. Is that not good news? Is it any wonder that Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, who's been doing their homework, learning the Lord's Prayer? Our what? Father in heaven. May we approach God humbly as the transcendent sovereign, yet boldly as an intimate father. Let's be a church that is making a regular path to the presence of God, not taking the one to whom we pray for granted, not treating prayer as a last resort, but a living breath. And may we recognize the one to whom we pray. And now I want you to see the meat of what he prays. Are you ready for this? Number two, may we be a church desperately needy for the strength of God. Desperately needy for the strength of God. In verse 16, Paul says, he begins by giving us the content of this prayer. One Greek scholar, A.T. Robertson, put it this way. He said, nowhere else in Scripture does Paul sound such depths of spiritual emotion or does he rise to such heights of spiritual passion? Like there is gut level, feel it, emotion and passion. This isn't just cold words. Do you feel this as we read it? That according to the riches of his glory that he may grant you and you and you and you and us to be strengthened with power through his spirit and your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. He says, according to the riches of his glory, he has all of heaven and all of earth at his disposal. We see God's riches throughout the book of Ephesians. His rich glory, or his riches which consist of his glory. Paul is going, are you ready for this? To the infinitely inexhaustible power source. God's riches are richly available, readily available, and at our disposal right now, having already saved us from death and hell and sin, given us eternal security, and now enabling us to live the way that he's called us to. Oh, this is, this is just dripping with honey. Look at it in verse 16. The riches of his glory. What is the glory of God? Glory is not just another attribute of God. It's not like God is powerful, God is holy, and he's kind, but he's also glorious. The glory of God or the riches of his glory is the sum of all that he is. One scholar said it's the plenitude of all his perfections. It's the fullness of all that God is. His inexhaustible wealth. Like my vocabulary is completely extended and so is Paul in trying to describe the richness of this. In summary, the attitude that Paul is praying with is, is this. The one to whom he prays has no shortness of supply, and this is a well that will never run dry. He intercedes for the church. You need to hear this. Assuming that God is willing, assuming that God is willing, and knowing that God is fully able, knowing that God is fully able. I think so often we go to the Lord knowing that he's fully able, but not assuming that he's willing. He can do it, but I don't think that he would for me. And the question is, why not? Well, you don't understand where I've been. Ma'am, sir, 
Uh, you don't understand that this church is full of people that might know how to wear a smile and might know how to put on a pair of shorts or a pair of khakis, but maybe you don't know where we've been. Because just because you can walk in with a smile and a pair of khakis don't know that, doesn't mean that you don't know what God's rescued us out of. And if he can do it in our lives, can he not do it in something so much smaller? So out of this abundance, Paul prays in summary that they would experience what we need to experience this morning afresh. The power of God and the presence of God. The power of God and the presence of God. Let's start with the power of God. Desperately needy for the strength of God. He begins with the power of God, strengthening by the Holy Spirit. Look with me in your Bibles. Strengthened with power. Strengthened with power. Meaning powerfully, mightily. It's a word often used in the Old Testament of the display of God's power unleashed to His people. Now, as I said in Ephesians 1, 15 through 23, Paul prayed that they would be aware of God's power. Now Paul prays that they would be lit up and strengthened with God's power. In other words, God's active. He's doing the work. They're passive. We're passive. Friends, you can be strengthened, and I can too this morning, with the strength that comes only from the Lord. You maybe have tried it in relationships and trying to act religious and alcohol and drugs and the fear of man and being a people addict and taking the next promotion and money and prestige and you are seeking a strength and a satisfaction that only can come through the Spirit. Seek the Lord in His strength, Psalm 105. Seek his presence continually. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, and act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Over and over in the Bible, we see exactly what we see in these verses, which we'll get to. And it's the dual idea of both power and love, strength and love. And he says, look in your Bible, that this comes through the Spirit. If you're in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. And throughout the book of Ephesians, Paul is praying that they would be, they'd wake up to God's wisdom and insight, being continually filled with the Spirit. And so he's applying the new covenant reality of the Spirit living in us to us waking up to what we have. He says, in your inner being. In other words, this is the very core of who you are. And this is that part of us that no one else sees. It's the control center of the man or woman. It's the center of our thinking, of our feeling, of our willing, of our emotions, of every part out of us. Do you need to be strengthened this morning in the core of who you are? Are you weary just trying to take the next step? Then you need to hear these verses. This is something that pop psychology can't provide. This is something that a modern therapeutic culture, which is what we have in America, can't deliver on. This is something that only Scripture and the Holy Spirit, through the context of the church, can accomplish. So we do not lose heart. That's a pretty ancient definition of burnout, is it not? You ever felt burned out by your circumstances? God knows I have. Though our outer self is wasting away. You know, people talk about life verses. Can I pick one? I'm going with 2 Corinthians 4.16. Somebody put this on a coffee mug. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. Romans 7.22 says, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another war waging, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. 
May the Holy Spirit enrich and invigorate us in the deepest part of who we are, strengthening us for all that God intended for us. I want you to follow with what Paul's doing here, what the Holy Spirit's doing. He moves with a prayer for you and I to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit. He moves from the power of God to the presence of God, to the indwelling of Jesus Christ. And look at what the Bible says. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. To strengthen and to dwell. This could be the result of what we just talked about. Or it could be another prayer request altogether. One way or the other, they're intricately related. God's power and God's love are two central realities that need to be in our prayers and in our lives. He says to dwell. I mean, we've been taught throughout Ephesians that those who are in Christ have been regenerated. They've been seated with Christ. They've been raised in the heavenly places. They're sealed by the Holy Spirit, united with Christ, incorporated into God's building project called the church. In other words, act like it. Act like it. And now, the point of this is that Christ would dwell in our hearts. The word dwell is a word that we've seen several times already in Colossians. You know what it means? It means to make yourself at home. How many of you have had company over and you said, yeah, yeah, just make yourself at home? And most people don't. They may grab a drink, but they're pretty respective of the boundaries. But some people, when you say, yeah, just make yourself at home, they do. <laughs> like they begin to just take over the house. So if you invite us over and you say, yeah, just make yourself at home, we're like, well, okay, we will. <laughs> take our shoes off. Your TV's my TV, right? <laughs> What do you do when you make yourself at home? You settle in. This ain't a hotel. I'm not checking in and out. This is your home. This is my home. This is our home now. And if it's going to be my home and I'm going to make myself at home, I want access to everything. You know that closet that when you're going to practice Reformation-style hospitality... and you don't want to clean up, but you want to make it look like you did, so you cram everything in there... Yeah, we'll have full access to everything. If we're going to dwell here, make it our habitation to live, to settle, and the word indicates a sense of finality. In other words, this house guest ain't leaving because he's no longer a house guest. What Paul is praying is that they would realize the full realization of Christ in their lives. And that the fingers of King Jesus would extend throughout every room in the house. And the house being our lives. Because when he first comes in, he comes into a mess. But the longer he stays, the more comfortable his presence is among us. Because as Christians, we seek not to grieve the Holy Spirit. And what happens as a person lives in a house is that the house then begins to reflect the person. Are you still with me? Have you ever walked into someone's house and maybe they're not even home? <laughs> Hopefully you had permission these days because you will get shot around here if you do that. And as you begin to walk around in the home, you might not even know whose house it is, but you can just kind of begin to pick up on who lives here like, it reflects them. It smells like them. It reflects their interest. This is clearly their house. And as you know, it, that's what happens the longer Christ dwells in us. Paul is praying that God in Christ would make his home and be warmly welcomed in every aspect of our lives. So much so that we then as his house, so permeated by his presence, this isn't where we are, this is where we want to be, would then smell like him, look like him, and be a reflection of him in every way we can to an lost and dying world. 
So positionally, we're in Christ, and Christ is in us. I want to press this on you and demand an answer. Practically, is Christ fully at home in you? Or does he seem a bit out of place? Walking on eggshells, having areas of our heart and our thought and our affections and our lives that is like a closed junk drawer that he does not have access to. Or are we truly a people who are content with Christ? Fully being conformed to the image of Christ, enjoying communion with Him. Again, he says, in your hearts, cardia, your inner being. So we see the power of God, we see the presence of God, we see this permeating the prayers of Paul. But then he shifts to where we need to go now. And may this be a banner over our church moving forward. That we would not only be a church that is given to humbly approaching the presence of God, desperately needy for the strength of God, but this needs to be us. Deeply established in the love of God. Look with me in verse 17. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, and the grammar indicates that either he's saying they already are or that they need to be. Either way, both's true. <laughs> May have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. <laughs> that they would be deeply established in the love of God. We come off of an era in our country that is con consumed with a church growth movement. And in that church growth movement, which we've experienced, and by church growth movement, I mean, do you remember the Willow Creek, Bill Hybels, Rick Warren type stuff, and now the Church of the Highlands type stuff? It's just, a, um, just an explosion of how to grow the church, how to get more people in, how to with good motives, how to reach people, how, if we're being charitable, how to have more people in the room at, at best. Can we please start using biblical terminology? Do you want to see biblical terminology for church growth? Do you want to see biblical terminology for the metrics that need to be used from now on to measure whether or not this church is growing or not? I know that we say this, but then we'll turn around and say, yeah, but what about the butts in the seat, the number of baptisms, and the budget? And those are all metrics that we need to look at. But can I give you two biblical metrics that are the metrics by which a church is judged in their spiritual growth? Rooted and grounded. Rooted and grounded. You say, man, it's just growing so fast. Don't forget this. Weeds always grow fast. Weeds always grow fast. We're not talking about shooting up like a weed. If I remember right, I've seen other things shoot up like a weed and promise something on the outside that they're not actually producing on the inside. And it was called a fig tree that Jesus cursed in the book of Mark. And that's not the sort of thing that we're looking at in Ephesians chapter 3. We're looking at metrics for true and genuine and eternal growth that's going to reach into eternity. And what Paul does here is what Paul does throughout the New Testament. He takes an agricultural metaphor and he takes an architectural metaphor. He takes an agricultural metaphor and an architectural metaphor. I want you to look in your Bibles in verse 17. He begins by talking about being rooted. In other words, this is something that doesn't wither. It's not swept away. It's sunk in the lavish love of God. It withstands the heat seasons. And if it can withstand July heat, 
in southern Alabama, maybe it can withstand anything. But it's not withering. So we move from the agricultural metaphor. I want you to look at the architectural metaphor for church growth. He says grounded. What it means is that it's unwavering. It has its foundation on the what? The rock. It's firmly established. Do we believe by now that we're heading for hard times as a country in one way or the other? I mean, it's one thing after the other. The coronavirus wasn't enough, so now let's have riots in the street. I mean, what's next before the next election and even afterwards? And what we need now more than ever is to be rooted that we are not withering and grounded, that we are not wavering. That we fall in love and then out of love. What is love? It's an unwavering commitment. It's the affection that God brings into our heart. And what it is not, and the way God loves his people is not, he loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, but I fail, and he loves me not. He loves me, and I sin, so he loves me not. Paul is describing not a fickle love, but an eternal love that's firmly rooted, secure in the love of God. Why do you think we have so many insecure people today? Because we're not secure in who God is and what God says that we are and who we are in God. So we're chasing for it and everything else. Oh, you got to hear what Calvin said. He said the true meaning here is that our roots ought to be so deeply planted and our foundation so firmly laid in love that nothing will be able to shake us. The love of Christ is held out, Calvin said, to us as the subject which ought to occupy our daily and nightly meditations and in which we ought to be wholly plunged. Can you be renewed this morning? Will you be wholly plunged in the love that God has for you and stop looking for it everywhere else? He moves to verse 18. And he says that we may have strength to comprehend with all the saints. In other words, this is for everybody. This isn't just for a group of people who are smart enough to get it or for a group of people who are spirit, spiritual enough to deserve it. He says with all the saints. And he uses the word comprehend, which is a colorful word that's used in the Old Testament of capturing an enemy of grasping, of seizing them. And here he's using it of grasping, wrapping our heads and our hands around an idea. And this is so interesting. He says the breadth, the length, the height, which is the typical dimensions of an object. And then he adds depth, depth. Now, here's the deal. Paul gives us the measurements for the object. Look back in your Bible and see if you can tell me one problem. The question is, what is the object? <laughs> well, some scholars think that he's looking back, describing the power of God, which reaches out to every corner of creation. Other scholars believe that he's talking about the love of God leaning forward to what's fixing to come next. You say, which one is it? I don't care. I love both. <laughs> and both are in the Bible. And you, you need this this morning. What does he mean by comprehending the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of the power, or more likely, the love of God. Through church history, there's been a lot of weird, just bizarre interpretations of what Paul's talking about. But most simply, what he seems to be saying is that either God's power, or more likely, God's love. Are you ready for this? 
is wide enough to reach the whole world and beyond. Ephesians 1, 9, 10, and 20. It's long enough to stretch from eternity to eternity. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6, Ephesians 3, 9. It's high enough to raise both Jews and Gentiles to heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 1, 13 and 2, 6. And it's deep enough to rescue people from the lowest pit that sin can drag us to and even from the very grip of Satan himself. In other words, you can run, but you can't hide. But you can't hide. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. To know the love of Christ. Like, can, you, can we swim in this just for a minute? To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge? What? Paul's saying, I want you to know what can't be known. I want you to know what can't be known. He's saying that you can truly know the love of God, but you can't fully know the love of God. This is something that surpasses our mental capabilities. In order for us to understand this, it would be about like trying to explain Facebook to an ant. He can't understand the answers because he still hasn't even understood the question. In other words, the love of God in Christ blows our mind. We can't even comprehend it. Paul is overwhelmed as he piles one phrase over the other. And it's important that we recognize that he's not walking off objective truth into some sea of weird mysticism like we see on the latest bestseller books in the modern Christian bookstore. What he's doing is he's anchoring us in truth and then he's saying, are you personally experiencing this not as just some cold abstract truth, but is this a reality in your heart? Are you swimming in the true and genuine love of God for his people? So much so that it overflows in your life. I can't tell you how many times I've sat across the desk with someone who says, yeah, but I can't forgive myself. I can't forgive myself. Friends, I want to suggest that that could be idolatry. Idolatry. So you mean to tell me that what Christ and the cross has done for you is insufficient. And you need to do something else to pay the debt that you can't pay because you're insufficient that Christ is already willing and able to take care of. You can't forgive yourself is not your problem. Your problem is that you need to experience the love and forgiveness of Christ by surrendering to Him and repenting and turning from your sin. So I want to ask us this morning, because we want to see fully formed disciples of Christ, we want to grow up in our salvation, do you look at yourself and do you doubt the love of God for you, Reformed Christians. I want to encourage you this morning to face your sin. And just as you face your sin, face your Savior. Kind of a sneak peek into what we'll be singing next month. What love could remember? No wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing. He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore, our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Amen? amen. What patience? If y'all don't start amen in me, like I'm going to amen me or something, somebody start talking. Do you not understand what I'm saying? What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father, hello, Father's Day. What father so tender is calling us home? Why are you so insecure? Why are you so rattled? Why is your cage rattled? Our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. 
What riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment. His life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. I want to introduce you to two twin towers that ought to be the songs of our church. And one of them is the power of God that we ought to pray that would be demonstrated in our life and in our church. Dependent not on our own selves to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, but dependent on the strength of God in our inner being. And the first twin Tower, the first song that we sing is How Great Thou Art. He splits the cedars. His voice render, uh, renders from heaven. How great is he? How great thou art. But if I could offer a second song, not only the power of God and his strength, but the love of God in Christ. As we sing that our sins are many, but his mercy truly is more. Do you remember as I was giving you a bit of a Greek lesson and a church history lesson? Whereby the point is that you can run, but you can't hide? Proof text. Know in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We don't need any more weak, weak Christians. Why? Because I am sure that neither death nor our life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor riots in the street, nor COVID in the air, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Christ, love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 5, 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Have you experienced this? Do you walk in this? Is this the flavor and aroma? Is this the culture of our home? Is this what's stirring in our church? You say, no, but I'd like to. Well, I'm glad you asked. Because through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, you too, friend, can be assured that your sins, though they are many, but through repenting and treasuring Christ and trusting Him, you can find that His mercy truly is more. Colossians 3.14 says, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And so my prayer for us is that we would be a church that truly is given to humbly approaching the presence of God in prayer. Desperately needy for the strength of God, realizing that we cannot do it on our own. And we're not willing to slip things in neutral and try. And may we be a people deeply established in the love of God. We'll pick up from here on Wednesday night, Lord willing. Father, we thank you. We thank you and we thank you. And we pray that you would help us not to be hoarders, but we pray that we would be channels for the blessing of God today and this week. Lord, this morning, in person or online, would you, we ask that you do a work of salvation. God, we pray that you would save people in our community. God, we pray that you would help us to be conduits of blessing and salvation to others. God, we pray that we would experience the strength and the sweet love of God afresh this morning and that we would be deeply established without wavering and without wiltering, that you would renew your people and call those who are not in your family to you. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. In light of that, let's stand together and sing our hymn of the month, How Great Thou Art.
be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. As we pray together, I want to share one Puritan prayer from the Valley of Vision in hopes that it inspires our own. Let's pray. He prays, Lord Jesus, if we love you, our souls will seek you. But can we seek you unless our love for you is kept alive to the end? Do we love you because you are good and can alone do us good? It's fitting that you should not regard us, for we are vile and selfish, yet we seek you. And when we find you, there is no wrath to devour us, but only sweet love. You do stand as a rock between the scorching sun and our souls. And we live under the cool as one of your elect. When our minds act without you, they spin into nothing but deceit and delusion. When our affections act without you, nothing is seen but dead works. Oh, how we need to abide in you. For we have no natural eyes to see you, but we live by faith in the one whose face to us is brighter than a thousand suns. When we see all that sin is in us, all shame belongs to us. Let us know that all good is in you and all glory is yours. Keep us from the error of thinking that you do appear gloriously when some strange light fills our hearts as if that were the glorious activity of grace. But let us see the truest revelation of yourself is with, when you do eclipse all of our own personal glory and you outweigh all the honor and pleasure and good of this world. The sun breaks out in glory when he shows himself as one who outshines all creation, makes men poor in spirit, and helps them to find their good in him. Lord, grant that we may distrust ourselves to see our all in you. Lord, we do pray this morning that you would rebuke us for our prayerlessness the audacity to think that we could do anything in our own strength and then be utterly confused when it turns into wreckage. But Father, we thank you that you sweetly and boldly invite us into your presence with every concern. And we pray that we would be a given a, a, as a people, as a church, to humbly approaching the presence of God as not only sovereign creator, but as Father and his friend with reverence and respect and with love. Lord, we pray that we would be a people desperately needy for the strength of God, for your power and for your presence in our lives. Lord, I pray even now that so many on our own prayer list struggling with tragic news from children to adults to plaguing health concerns to irreconciled relationships among family, desiring salvation. God, we pray that you would strengthen right where they need it in their inner being. Lord, we pray that we would be a church deeply established in the love of God. And we thank you on this Father's Day that we all who have repented of our sins and believe in Christ have a Father in heaven. And Lord, we pray for all of those on our prayer request list, for Mike Granger, for Kathy Hughes' grandbaby, for Naomi and Ashley and Nick Carter's family, for Emma White, God, for Tammy Cope, for Darby Whitman, for the Upchurch family, for the Anthonys, for Houston Scroggins, for... Luann Morbidelli's nephew, Lord, would you move in strong and powerful ways, showing that you are near to the brokenhearted, showing their need for you and experiencing your comfort this morning, even as we pray. Father, we pray for the Mullins' son-in-law, for their former church that is now closed. We pray for the ministry that will occupy that space and for their blessing. Father, we pray for our members who are away settling into other places for Alex Beasley, for Will Glassford as he's on the road. 
God, we pray for non-members, for the Lenz family as they relocate from Italy to here, for Eden Williams, who's in the nursing home with COVID, for Crystal, who is experiencing pain in her back, for Hugo, who will be joining us from France as an exchange student. Lord, would you please impart salvation? And in each one of these image bearers, would you show yourself strong? And Father, we pray for Brantwood. We pray for the closing of the abortion clinic. We pray for all of the ministries that are represented among this flock, that your, your hand would be so clearly at work, drawing men and women, boys and girls, to Christ, seeing human flourishing in the world. And Father, we pray for our missionaries. We pray that you would strengthen them in their inner being as the barns are stateside, struggling with a potential death in the family, unsure when they'll be able to return back to Peru, for Amanda and Ethiopia, for the Chavezes, for Katie and Peru. Lord, we spend the whole globe for the Brown family as they minister in the, on the other side of the world. Father, we pray that the banner of Christ will be planted in every tribe, nation, and language for your encouragement among our missionaries. And Lord, we pray again for the moral chaos that we find our country in. For the racism, for the riots, for the issues in the police department. Father, we thank you for our law enforcement. And we pray that it would be used for good and not evil. God, we pray then in the midst of the fallout of the coronavirus, that you would continue to help people recover and rebuild. And we pray that your, your gospel would go forth and repentance would be provoked through this in us as a nation. And we thank you for the strength and the love of God that's available to us in Christ. What a joy. Thank you for this church. Help us to continue to grow up in our salvation in truth and in love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time in our service, we normally take our offering, which you can do by dropping that off in the very back in the box or the plate on your way out, as well as giving online through Venmo or our P.O. box. And so there are several important things that you'll notice in your worship guide um, as you know, on our Reformation uh, members Facebook page, I post a weekly video and a lot of different prayer requests and updates. If you're not checking that out or at least receiving it through emails, then I'm not going to explain that to you here. I'll just trust that if you want to know, you'll go there, and that's a vital source of information. We've also been walking through a new series on there called Recommended Reading with some videos that are also on our YouTube channel. Be sure and check those out. I think you'll find them helpful. We'll meet back as we normally do on Wednesday night at 6.30. And then also for all of you men who want to join us beginning next Sunday night at 4.30 for our new men's study, we have all of our books in. We have those right down here. You can see my dad, Ray, for those. Uh, we were actually able to get those for $11 a piece and we have a stack of them. When they're gone, you're on your own. And that will be next Sunday from 4.30 to 6. You have homework to read the first two chapters this week. And then I really want to encourage you to join us. What we'll do is we'll come next Sunday evening for an hour and a half. And we could stay all night. But this is more like a marathon, not a sprint. We're just going to show up and uh, pray together, talk about our reading, enjoy fellowship in a structured yet casual way and hopefully see more and more men, young and old, equipped uh, in our church to minister and to be ministered to. So go ahead and grab your book today. We have extras if you didn't order. As soon as we're able, soon we're still talking about working, about, uh, working on getting uh, Sunday school back in order, nursery and children and all of that. Um, we're putting some things in place and um, looking at in the next week or two, beginning that back. 
Um, also, the Lenz family, we have a table set up here. Um, this is a family, for some of you who may not know, that is in Italy right now. And they're coming here, but they'll be quarantined, thank goodness, for two weeks. They can't leave their house. But what that means is they're going to be here uh, in Montgomery as a military family. And for two weeks, they're not going to really have anything until their stuff arrives. So we've connected with them um, through email, through online. They've been watching the services. Really, they've been watching everything. And um, so we have a list that Joel's posted, and Joel is uh, taking the lead on this of things that we need. A lot of things have already been taken care of, but we still have a few things. So will you please jump in? I, and let me just say this. This is a low-maintenance church. There's not many things that I ask of you and that we ask of one another. We're like a Wednesday, Sunday, and then hospitality. But when we do put needs out there and ask you, we really want you to jump in and do that because we intentionally don't flood you with 100 things. So when we put something out there, like we really want people to jump in on this if possible. Is everybody with me? So, Joel, we still have a few things left that we need, right? And there's a list up here. And you can bring those things with the intent that they'll be returned to you after their two-week quarantine. Um, if you get coronavirus, that's on you. Oh, is it two months? All right. Two months. Um, it would obviously be better if we could just donate that to them, and then if they don't need it, then they could pass that along to someone else. But either way, there's a list. Let's bless them. We've been in contact with them quite a bit. They'll only be here for a year, so they want to dive right in before they get a uh, place somewhere else. I want to encourage us to continue in prayer for our missionaries Continue learning the Lord's Prayer in our uh, hymn of the month. Again, we don't ask very much. But when we do, like I'm really trusting that young and old alike, you're learning the Lord's Prayer. I'm really trusting that. I'm not asking much of you, but when we say this, it's not just to say, hey, if you want to. No, like we're leaning in, doing this together, and there's going to be a test. People are going to show up at your house on Thursday. No, I'm just kidding. But I am serious, but I am just kidding about the test. Well, why don't we turn to our benediction and commission, which comes from 2 Corinthians 4.16. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. May we be a church giving to calling upon God and communing with Him in prayer, depending on Him, desperate for Him, and delighting in Him. Let's stand and end our service by singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and 